Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to this Australian Water School webinar brought to you by Icewarm. Yep, that's right, 91 webinars over the past three years. It's a webinar series that engages leading thinkers in the water sector globally. And today is no exception. Rachel Siddall from SA Water will lead the discussion on reconciliation in the water sector. My name's Trevor Filler. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at Icewarm and Chair of the Australian Water School webinars. And you can see on that screen in front of you there, there's a lot of stuff happening. Every month this happens, free webinars, online courses. Go to our website, you'll get all the details there. That would be fantastic. But it's about you and there you all are, spread across the globe. Well, we're right into today's webinar. Rachel, please join us. It's fantastic to have you today. Uh, Rachel's SA Water Manager of Community and Aboriginal Engagement has over 20 years experience working with communities both within Australia and globally through water sanitation, water and sanitation projects. Uh, Rachel's an anthropo anthropologist working to bring cultural understanding and action to SA Water uh, and is working with teams on the ground in partnership with Aboriginal communities to enable successful reconciliation outcomes. Welcome. So good to have you. Thank you for taking the time. It's wonderful. Thanks, Trevor. I'm really looking forward to, um, yeah, having a chat to everyone and learning what's happening globally. It's amazing that we've got so many people um, joining us internationally and within it's, Australia. It is fantastic, Rachel. I, I'm noticing the numbers going up there on the board. It's wonderful to have everybody join us. And where are you from, Rachel? Where, where, are, you, where are you presenting from? Um, Adelaide, hot Adelaide. 40 plus. Yeah, 40 and I think 46 on Friday. So Joking. it's quite scary living in it this is. climate change environment. It is. Over to you, Rachel. Wonderful to have you. Great. Thanks, Trevor. And and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I think this is uh, really exciting to be able to have this conversation because it is actually a really important international um, matter. But first of all, before I get started, um, I'd really really like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Ghana people on whose land I actually meet on today and to acknowledge the enormous um, contribution that they bring to our society, but also the spiritual connection um, that they have to the land and water and it's um, and the importance to their life, um, cultural vitality and identity. And I'd also like to acknowledge because we do meet um, many of you um, come from the global community that uh, we also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which you meet as well um, to, yeah, again, talk about this um, really important matter. So before I get started, I just wanted to um, to show you some of the artwork that we have had designed by um, the community here in South Australia. So these are five different waterholes that represent the different communities across our state, all the way from the APY lands down to the Naranjiri people down in um, the south. And as you can see, they're very intricately detailed, but they're icons from all of those areas that are important to the people from the from those those communities. So you can see the whale in um, in this icon and the Ghana people's icon here and the Narunga people with the um, the ibis and the, the snake and then um, down here we've got the pelican for the Naranjiri people and people of those coastal areas. So we use this um, branding for a lot of our signage and um, also for lots of promotional work and it really is again I guess recognising I guess the vast lands that we work on um, across South Australia and the Aboriginal people that make up those vast lands. So just a little bit about SA Water, I won't um, harp on too much about this because we're here to talk about reconciliation, but we are the leading provider of water and wastewater services and to about 1.7 million people um, from across the state. We operate as a government owned statutory body. Um, so we're actually also overseen by an independent board, um, which makes us um, a little bit independent from government. Um, but we operate across all of South Australia, all the way from the APY lands, um, right up in the northern Australia across the whole state and of course in Adelaide and urban areas. We've got about oh, more than 27,000 kilometres of pipeline across the state so um, that's how vast our operations are. And we have about um, 1,500 people that work for the organisation as direct employees. 
Um, so why is reconciliation important? Um, well, within South Australia, we have about 30,000 First Australians living here, which is about 2% of the total population. Um, but um, we're seeing this continual life expectancy gap between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians widening. So we know that things like diabetes and suicide kills about 6.4 times more Indigenous Australians than the national average. So there's been a national, um, I guess, agenda set around closing this gap between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. And um, reconciliation is one of those aspects to try and do that. So we feel that um, because of our footprint across South Australia, that we can actually um, really have a direct impact in trying to close this gap. While we can't attribute that at this point in time, the activities that we're um, working on is all in the aim of trying to close that unacceptable life expectancy gap. Um, we also see reconciliation as really bringing great diversity of ideas and approaches to our work, which actually creates a better place to work and brings new um, ideas um, to the table. So whilst we're trying to deal with this important social matter, we actually um, are seeing the benefits of what it can bring to our workforce and how people work and the decisions that we make. So I won't go through all those statistics, um, but you can see that there are still, um, the gap is still widening. And I think the, the latest closing the gap report only showed one or two indicators that were on track. Um, so we still have a long way to go as a nation to really get this, um, this thing on track. We also look at reconciliation as part of our work towards the um, sustainable development goals, particularly particularly in those areas around um, good health and wellbeing, education, and of course, um, what our core business is about, clean water and sanitation. Um, so at a national scale, the dimensions of reconciliation for those people that don't um, know that much about it, <coughs> has five key areas, which is about improving race relations, equity and equality, unity, institutional integrity. And um, this last one is about historical acceptance. So within the um, framework of reconciliation, organisations and businesses can sign up to different levels of wraps, that's what we call them here, um, from the really, I guess, emerging early stages of, um, you know, having a reconciliation plan as a reflect plan, all the way to an elevate. At SA Water, we've um, we've got a stretch, which is which is along, is about the third um, highest um, wrap, and we're actually developing our fourth new wrap and have decided because we, um, we're still on this journey, um, far from from um, you know, finishing it and only really at the start that we need to continue to keep embedding it within our business and make it front of mind for our people and our contractors and our communities. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working on a stretch wrap. Um, just a little bit about the Aboriginal landscape in South Australia. This um, colourful map on the left is, I guess, the, the traditional land tenure of all the language groups across Australia. Um, you can see the boxed in bit being um, South Australia. So we have about 30 different language groups that we work with um, across the state, each with really distinct cultural practices and different languages and different community setups. Um, and there's a variety of different land tenure arrangements in place um, across the state as well from um, the native from native title determinations to the APY lands um, land rights act which is up in the far north of South Australia. The other map is all the communities that we service um, across um, South Australia. These are our really remote communities. Um, so there's 22 communities that we've been servicing with water and wastewater services, um, Aboriginal communities that is. So just a little bit about what we're doing <clears throat> within these Aboriginal communities from a supply point of view. Um, you will get more information. I believe there's a webinar coming up uh, some point next year that will actually talk about the technical details around how we work with these communities and actually provide water. Um, but currently there's about, um, we supply about a million litres of water to these populations. And most of them are RO or desalination plants 
and um, there many of them in the APY lands are operated by solar boards. So we've been really, I guess, trying to look at innovation, innovative solutions to service these communities and solar bore makes a, a lot of sense and uh, where we can upgrade those, we are continuing to do that. We also do projects which I'll talk about in a little while um, around um, greening community um, ovals to lead to better social and health outcomes. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But as I said, this is our third wrap. Um, our wrap, as I said, has really been about embedding um, reconciliation and making, making sure that everybody understands it as their responsibility. And look, that's not an easy feat. Um, people come with different values and ideas, but we really wanna make sure that our workplace is a safe place for our Aboriginal staff to work but also that we're um, continuing to build awareness within our um, workforce about the importance of this to our business. Um, so what we're really, I guess, focusing on is building relationships with communities, um, respect, um, looking at opportunities and mainly around, I guess, Aboriginal employment. So we have about two and a half percent of our workforce. That's our direct workforce, that's not including the indirect outcomes from um, our contractors who we invest a lot of money in to deliver a lot of our services. Um, so, and also what's important to us is not necessarily the percentage and the number that gets set in a lot of wraps, but actually that we retain our people and um, making sure that they have really great opportunities in the future to thrive and develop. We also uh, support Aboriginal businesses through our own procurement, but also through um, our contractor requirements within their contracts to make sure that there's opportunities in the entire supply chain for Aboriginal businesses. Um, and I guess the other aspects, I'll talk about some specific projects around education and um, and our cultural awareness programs, but um, we also do a lot of work in supporting communities in hardship with their internal um, infrastructure. A lot of communities don't get, particularly homelands where people have moved away from from communities into homeland areas where they don't get um, a lot of support for their infrastructure. We've been helping them with repairs um, to some of their internal work. And of course, celebrating Aboriginal culture and diversity. We have a lot of events during the National Reconciliation Week and um, NAIDOC week, but, we, but for us, um, whilst we do a lot during those weeks, it shouldn't just be at that time of the year. We wanna make sure that reconciliation is embedded in everything that we do. So in terms of our governance structure, we have a RAP committee. I think most people that have RAPs would have a committee. We have an external co-chair who um, is an Aboriginal leader within the community. And that's um, also co-chaired with one of our general managers. Our CEO sits on that committee, um, as well as all the senior managers who are responsible for actions within the plan. So we have 101 actions. Um, and this committee meets four times a year. And really their role is to <clears throat> ensure accountability, that we're actually delivering on what we've said within our plan. Um, so that's actually really important, I think, for <clears throat> the, sorry, the success of any um, RAP, that, we, um, that there is an accountability element to it. Um, we also have a group called The Collective, which is a group of um, Aboriginal, our Aboriginal staff who meet twice a year. They talk about um, issues within the workplace, they contribute to our RAP, um, they raise community issues and, um, uh, and are an important part of our, our governance structure. They meet yeah, twice a year and they also have access to the CEO um, within those meetings as well. Obviously, we get feedback through our engagement processes with the Aboriginal community. Um, and whilst our RAP work sits within our corporate, um, our communications and strategy area and innovation area, um, our HR team has a big role to play, particularly in terms of the employment and retention piece that we're working on. So the inclusion and diversity committee is important to this um, structure as well. Um, so the role of our board and obviously our senior leadership team is to to make the final decisions on um, yeah our investment in in our RAP plan. In terms of accountability, it's really important to us that 
<clears throat> we deliver on what we've said. We develop this infographic each year to talk about, I guess, key highlights, but also for us to be able to measure how we're performing um, year on year. So um, we kind of measure some of our work against, I guess, um, state statistics and where we're trying to head with some of our stretch targets, but also general activities that we're doing. So you can see from this one, although this isn't about the detail, um, this is just to show you how we report um, our investment in Aboriginal owned businesses is increasing and that's because we have, we're able to uh, track how many of our contractors are in bed. Well, this is actually just SA Water, but we're able to track this now, which we weren't able to do in previous years. We did spend 7.3 million through our partners and contractors. Um, so that's, that's in there as well. So a couple of things on our pro, our key projects, um, working on country projects, which, which lots of people do. This is really about, um, yeah, working on a lot of SA water land to do some rehabilitation work but also fire burning to manage land in a more effective way and we um, use traditional um, owners and methods to help us with those projects. Um, we we'll artwork on infrastructure and whilst this um, looks really great and we're able to involve um, the community what's really important about this is the statement of reconciliation in these community in these communities. So this um, was a, a pipeline project that we worked with a group, uh, the Bungala people up in Port Lincoln and they worked with school groups to um, paint this pipeline um, but, but as I said what's important is that it's not just the act of doing the artwork but it's about sharing knowledge and also turning ugly infrastructure into beautiful infrastructure and also is sending a message about the importance of Aboriginal knowledge. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the other two photos later on, um, but one of the other progra programs we've been working on is the greening of the amateur oval. So um, in this slide, you can see to the left, the old oval that um, there used to be two ovals side by side. So the green oval used to look like the oval next to it, um, but we actually had an issue. And so this community is about 1500 kilometers from Adelaide. And we had an issue with excess water, wastewater. Um, so rather than building another lagoon, um, the community and us came up with the concept of, of um, taking that water back into the oval and greening it up. So we um, have an irrigation system in place, um, about 70,000 litres of wastewater is treated at the plant and then it's pumped onto uh, through an underground system onto the oval. And uh, we also reseeded it and got it to AFL standard. And just last month we um, had Port Power, which is an Adelaide um, football club, uh, who joined us in the lands to launch the oval and kids um, came out for clinics. But what it really does show is, I guess, you can come up with some really innovative solutions to problems and bring great benefit to the community, both socially and also from a health perspective. I also just want to show this video. It's a two minute video, um, if I can get it up. It's called Water Wisdom. And basically we've been engaging with communities across the South Australia to really get a better understanding of their connection to water. And also, I guess the innovations that they use to manage water, both, to, both in the past, but also um, in the present. So what we've been doing is filming four different, so far, communities ranging from um, coastal all the way out to the Flinders where it's very dry and they're dealing with massive drought to really talk about what water means to them and I guess the innovations and the technologies that they used. This is just a really short um, version of a couple of those stories, um, but we're yet to release these. We'd really like to get them um, put onto mainstream media to really share this really important story. So I'll just put this on now to play. Fresh water systems are fundamental to Australia's first people who have nurtured a deep understanding of water flow across the landscape. There is a growing recognition of this ancient connection. My name is Jack Buxkin. Join me as I discover how my people found and manage fresh water on the driest continent on earth. In this series, I've had the opportunity to travel to various parts of South Australia and meet the local Aboriginal people who have been kind enough to share with me their wisdom 
about how they sourced and manage fresh water resources. I caught up with Uncle Frank Wanganin, who took me to a freshwater spring. This is where Jabuki stopped, and through the loss of his favourite nephew Kulatui, and uh, he put him down, and through the, his tears, it formed natural springs. And part of the story is tells them where they, they can actually get water. You can tell it's fresh water, it's not salty water, but it has a bit of a dirt taste to it. My next stop is Mount Gambia. Oh, look here, we've got a bit of bull kelp. This is gold. This is what our people used to use to, to make a water container. Yeah, carrying water would be in a, in a pelt, or a bull kelp was particularly good because it doesn't become rotten or disflavour it. Like bladders and skins are not as good as a bull kelp carrier. Shells, animal skulls, there we go, that, that's how we carry our water. This is like fossil water. This has been filtering down through the, the limestone and the sandstone for hundreds of years. You can only get to this at low tide. We know from our grandparents and our parents that this is where we come. As it bubbles up, coming through the limestone, it's been filtered. I remember it being sweet from years ago. Mm. If there's uh, any leaves or insects gathered on the water, we brush aside any unwanted stuff that could be in the water. That's a banksia. And into there, if we're a little bit doubtful about the water, we'd put in the, the she-oak cones. Those cones are left in there for a while and uh, they sort of steep any of the bacteria out, as far as we know, and then you, you can drink it again. The South Australian Museum curates one of the largest collections of Aboriginal artefacts in the world. To round off my trip, I've been invited to visit their archives in Netley. What we have in the centre is a, a wallaby water bag. This is a, a wild dog, and this is a rabbit. Some of the bigger animals um, were used more as your kind of your tanks around camp, and then like the, the rabbit or like a possum, uh, that's for your kind of day trips when you're going shorter distances. Aboriginal people, um, in order to access water, they dug these roots from the mallee tree, and so the water will be extracted from that, and this is this is the end product. So this water is over 100 years old, but it still looks like it's pretty drinkable to me. Increasingly, we are coming to understand that the knowledge and technologies Aboriginal people have been using for thousands of years have relevance to us today and for the future. Yeah, so I think for us this has been a really important piece to really shed light on water knowledge um, of our first Australians and to really just uh, appreciate the, um, the amazing ideas and opportunities that were created uh, through managing water. So we, we're crea creating another two this financial year. So yeah, we're looking forward to seeing how they'll evolve as well. Um, just quickly, I know I've probably taken a, a bit bit much time we want to have some time for questions but we also do lots of water education in communities um, also taking kids out to water holes to with traditional owners to talk about how water was used out there and they get involved in some water testing and getting an understanding of how water gets to their um, to their taps in their homes we also do lots of stuff with teachers um, and are working on um, some training with the Anangu teachers in the lands um, around water because it's all linked into the national curriculum which is fantastic um, so we'll continue working across um, the lands and also in the far west coast and we also um, our Aboriginal staff get really involved in working with Aboriginal students who are involved in STEM programs and um, I think what's really great is we have engineers and all sorts of really um, technical and professional experts within SA Water that um, are real great role models for emerging and young people to come up because these will be our people who will be working for us in the future and I think it's a great insight for them to see um, what opportunities exist for their career in the future. 
another really important part for us is not just basic cultural awareness. We do do that across the business, um, a training, a three hour session. But for us, it's really about um, sharing skills and cultural knowledge. So this picture is um, a course we run in the lands, um, lots of leaking taps around the community. And um, so we take our plumbers um, up there and they uh, teach basic plumbing skills directly into the community. And um, so this one, they've just set up some pallets and um, hammered on some taps and we just work through how to change um, fittings and to get your taps working better. We also run it through the Trade Training Centre, uh, which is a little bit more um, technical because so we have a table that's set up. But this is really great because it's really out in the community and our people come back with a lot more um, appreciation of life in community and a really great greater understanding of um, cultural knowledge. So it's a really great exchange. Um, and we have a lot of um, interesting, lots of our people wanting to take part in it, but also the community wanting more of this type of um, working together. We also have a skill sharing program where we take um, other types of skills within the business um, and work with Aboriginal NGOs. So at the moment, we've got six people working across two different Aboriginal organisations, helping them with their strategic plans um, and financial planning, um, governance and board. Um, skills, a whole range of different um, skills that we um, are sharing and our staff come back with much greater cultural knowledge um, as well. So that's the kind of cultural exchange that we're really the two way learning that's important to us. I guess um, some of the work, and like I said earlier, we are still on our journey and there's I'm sure lots of you out there who are much more advanced and are doing um, a lot of great things and um, I'd love to hear from you about what you're doing in that space. But some of the learnings we've had is that when you're developing um, reconciliation action plans, it's really important to involve your internal staff, um, but also of course the community in its design and implementation. Um, so we've just been doing a statewide engagement process around our wrap. Um, and just finishing up taking all that feedback now to develop our new plan. Um, I think also moving beyond the targets and although I've talked talked about statistics and um, the number of employees we have, what's actually really important is the long term outcomes and making sure that the business commits to this because lots of places have uh, wraps but don't provide any resourcing for it or staff and um, we've been really lucky to have two staff in our team plus um, a budget that gets distributed across the business to enact um, and to actually action all the plans uh, actions that we've committed to. Um, looking at expanding our remit so whilst you know this for lots of businesses reconciliation makes good business sense it's actually you can have a big influence across all south australians and our community art projects we feel does this as well as the knowledge sharing um, through the digital stories that we've produced um, provides that voice that sometimes doesn't get heard relationships are really important and earning trust and being flexible with the pace and timelines um, is, is really important. And whilst it's really hard in a very fast paced business, um, we have to really work on making sure that we do spend time in community and really develop those relationships. And that means working out of the nine to five and working on weekends and um, traveling to remote areas and actually spending time getting to know people. Um, we've also learned that having greater influence over our indirect outcomes, and by that I mean with our partners and contractors, that we actually all need to be on the same page and we can all have a, a greater influence when we work together on this. Um, I think also really, as I said, I mean, these are all the same things, questioning our own bias and values as part of the process. And that's actually one of the really important pillars of um, reconciliation is historical acceptance and also understanding, um, I guess, where we come from and trying to change some of that, which does make it difficult um, in a, a massive workforce with all sorts of um, different types of people coming from different backgrounds. Um, also really, um, I guess, embedding what we're going to be working on is really embedding reconciliation into our corporate strategy and our business planning processes and also our regulation process so that it's not a standalone document um, that relies on 
you know, several champions to run it, but it's actually part of um, our DNA and um, how we do business. And the way to do that is to have it, you know, embedded within our corporate strategy. So that's all from me. I hope there's been um, some information that's been of use. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, yes, of use, I'm sure, from all the comments coming in here, that's fantastic. Um, uh, Jason says that video is incredible. Can't wait for the series to be released. It's on the chat line if you want to hit the chat oh, okay. button at the bottom. But look, okay, uh, let's not waste any time. Let's get into these questions pretty snappily, shall we? Uh, Jason's asked, water literacy is paramount in having discussions with traditional owners. Uh, what are the other states, territories doing uh, around the water market literacy and entitlement frameworks? That's the top question of the, uh, of the day. A little bit of the up Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure there's people here who could answer that better than me. I'm quite focused on SA Water and what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of water literacy, that's really about us understanding that in a different perspective as well. So not just um, us, that's why we've created these digital videos, yeah. which is really to um, show what that, um, the innovation and the knowledge was around. And that's part of water literacy, not just the technical terms that we use on a daily basis, but oh. building that traditional understanding into how we make decisions. And you would, you would hope, and probably this would happen, that in relation, in relation to this question, other states will see what you're doing and probably start doing the same thing themselves. You know, the videos will travel. Yeah, I hope so. And I know the Water Corp in WA are doing a lot within um, reconciliation and um, yeah, lots of other water utilities um, across, across the nation. William asked the question, to what extent uh, is old ways engineering for water and land management being implemented in current practice? Old ways engineering. Um, look, I think uh, that's we're an engineering business, a traditional engineering business, so it's still very prevalent in how we um, manage water. Um, I but I think I don't understand this term, uh, capital O, capital W, old ways engineering. There must be a, um, a, a, a yeah a, a program like that. Unless it's uh, meaning from uh, Aboriginal ways, how is Aboriginal Probably. knowledge being used in engineering? Look, I think we have a, a long way to go to actually bring that into how we design sure. our infrastructure. Um, but look, it's a great, it's a great um, thing to work towards. It is. It is. Yeah, thanks, William. That's a great question. And I'll be uh, shooting these questions to you after the um, webinar is over, Rachel, and you can choose to take up further if you wanted to. With each great. Person. That's right. I'll yeah. leave it with you. That's good. Uh, Jason King has asked, when and how do we include traditional owners into water entitlements uh, mm. when in the basin all rivers are over allocated? What a question. Yeah, look, I think that is a question, not that I want to pass the buck to the Department no. of Environment mm. and Water. They manage water allocations. Um, but I know that there is work around cultural flows and we're actually working with a group at the Naranjiri down um, down in the lower lakes area with some land. Um, we're putting a project around how that might look with um, utilising some of our SA water land for um, cultural purposes and utilising that cultural water. But yeah, look, I mean, I think that's a really, that's a really good point around uh, water allocation. And obviously it's the national discussion at the moment too. Yep. Uh, follow up question from Jason. How many Aboriginal people are employed at SA water and do you have a target within RAP for that? Yeah, so we've got about 46, which is about 2.8% um, um, uh, we have a stretch target of 4.5%. The Aboriginal population in SA is 2%. So we're above, I guess, the population. But yeah. what I said before is it's actually about retention and making yeah. sure that um, we have long term opportunities for people as well. Great thought. Yeah, that's a great thought. Uh, in the video, uh, Isa says, in the video, wasn't that water saline? <laughs> Great question, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just move on. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, that's really just to demonstrate how they did it. But no, you're right. He, I have a notion, though, a that there are, there are freshwater lenses that do end up on the beach. Yeah, and you can see that how it, how it was bubbling up. Mm. Um, yeah. My guess is that it was probably, probably also fairly fresh, too. Yeah. Nick yeah. says, how can a RAP enhance an organisation's prospects for Aboriginal employment? 
Well, I think if you get it right and you create culturally safe environment for um, your Aboriginal staff and you have good opportunities and you start working with young people, like I talked about our STEM and our Aboriginal role models within the business that work with young students, Aboriginal students, and you actually demonstrate a commitment and you're doing work and building relationships with communities, people will want to work for you as an employer of choice. So I think getting all of that right um, helps you to attract um, you know Aboriginal people which is leading to opportunities to close the gap. Thank you. Humira has, has asked um, has anyone looked into water custodianship in Aboriginal groups? I know in some First Nations such as Canada the mm -hmm. custodian of waters are women. This has helped water management uh, made easier as it shows a new perspective. Uh, for some of men's and women's roles in mm. the environmental management. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And we actually had a group from Canada come over last week um, to meet with our Ghana youth people around um, water and water management. And we're actually, whilst I know you're talking about custodians, men and women, we're, we're really working on um, succession planning with involving young people. We have some youth forums coming up in the new year so um yeah look i think that's a really important part but to also expand that to look at you know other other groups as well young people etc yep georgina's asking this question mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. rachel if you see this uh, hi we all know water is basic necessity in all human societies however sustainability of water resources should be paramount i want to know if there are sustainable measures put in place to help in sustaining our water resources it's a fairly wide question but i think it's focused on uh, sustaining water resources in yeah. remote communities, Indigenous communities. Yeah, and some of that is about education too with how much water people are using. Mm. Um, so we we have a big focus on um, working working with um, schools, as I said, in the, in the APY lands where we know there's a lot of water usage. I'm just talking about the Aboriginal perspective yeah. here. There's yeah. obviously yeah. Um, everyone needs to work on that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, by building education awareness um, and as a water utility, we actually take that pretty seriously and have a whole education program centred around that. Yep, no, that's great. Thanks a lot, Georgina. Shanta has said, what were the tools or how did you include reflection of community opinion into your action plans? Yeah, so um, as I said before, this is we're actually working on our fourth wrap at the moment. Um, what I've talked about is our previous wrap, and what we've really uh, noticed was that there wasn't a lot of engagement at that point in time, and we've had to pull some of those actions out to really make sure that they are, we're not doing things to Aboriginal people, but we're actually working with Aboriginal people. Mm. Um, and um, so this time round, we've been running workshops across the state, um, talking about how communities want to work with us, what's important to them, um, and also what does you know reconciliation look like in ten years' time. So we've done that process both with our staff internally, but also with communities. And so we've got some great ideas that we can now build into our plan. But we need to continue to work with those communities around implementing them together. And things like the digital story is a great way um, to engage and to share that knowledge. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks a lot, Shanta. And that's, they're, they're great questions. Um, there's, it's interesting, we talked here um, among uh, my colleagues around this webinar before the webinar today. And one of the questions that came up was, what needs to happen for reconciliation to be sustained in organisations mm. after champions like yourself have moved on or no longer there? Look, I think it all comes down, Trevor, to embedding it within yeah. the business so it becomes yeah. business as usual. And that's why our point around making sure that it's not a standalone plan, that it's bedded into our corporate strategy yeah. means that it continues on. And you actually do have to have investment allocated to it yeah. um, because, you know, even knowledge sharing and, and these projects, Aboriginal people need to be paid. It's not yeah. a, you know, that's a really important aspect to it. So having a budget and uh, and embedding it as, you know, business mm. as usual, I think yeah. is, and that is a, a long process that doesn't happen overnight. No, I can imagine. You've done a lot of work in this area. We're, we're so delighted to be able to have this uh, time together with you. We'll draw this to a close now. Um, we appreciate everybody's discussion and it's been fantastic to be um, uh, talking about this issue 
doing stuff together is such an important thing. So there's a feedback form going to come up in a moment. Um, I'd love you to just click that out, uh, click on those, those um, answers. Uh, we'll, we'll email everyone a, a link to this recording. You can see the free webinars uh, coming up uh, over the next month, every month we're doing this. So go on our website, uh, join our Twitter feed and and, uh, and uh, get the details around these uh, opportunities. Uh, it'll be, you'll, you'll be glad you did. Um, nothing left to say except thanks again and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we so enjoyed the time discussing this, this critical issue. Uh, any closing words from yourself, Rachel? No, thanks for the opportunity. And look, I'd love to talk to um, anyone who has stories to share or we can learn from each other or even join up approaches around um, this really, you know, fundamental issue, even globally. Yep. So please yep. get in touch. Yep. I'd love to love to have a chat. Wonderful. Thanks again. Great. Rachel, Thank thanks you. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you next time you join the webinars. Bye for now. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au.